everybody, and welcome to Collider Movie Talk, movie talk for movie fans. I'm your host, Wendy Lee, and this is The Daily Show, where we bring you the latest news from the world of movies, plus some insight to what it all means. Joining me today is Perry Nemiroff. Hey guys, welcome to a Friday edition of Movie Talk. It's going to be a great show today. We got the sidebar back in action. It's been a Movie Talk marathon for me this week, but I have been so grateful to be on the show. So thank you guys so much for the support and for watching. And I'm really grateful to have this panel with me today because I got two awesome guys right to my right. Wendy, who's joining me? He has gravitas, John Rocha. <laughs> What an intro. Thank you, Wendy. That's awesome. Hey, everybody. Uh, I'm happy to be back. Friday, I missed last week because I was in Miami interviewing The Rock, seeing Baywatch. What an awesome experience. Uh, you guys can go to the, I think, the Schmoes No page or the Collider page to see the video, uh, see my my uh, my fat ass running on the beach. So it's, uh, it's a lot of fun. <laughs> and interviewing The Rock, who was awesome. And the one with the mightiest beard, David Griffin. It's growing. It's got a little ways to go, but I'm excited because we get to talk about, we got uh, the Black Lightning trailer. We got The Witcher was announced as a Netflix television series. We got a lot to talk about. Oh, wait. Wait. No, oh, this is, no, wrong show. Jeez. Gotta you wait till Monday. What? I got a little ahead of myself. I gotta wait till Monday. I gotta you know wait till Monday. There, there's some exciting stuff in the TV realm. I can't, I can't knock you for that. But right now, before we hit everything on the sidebar, there was a pretty big thing that broke last night. Warner Brothers lifted the social media embargo on Wonder Woman reviews because a bunch of people have gotten to see it over the past week. I was actually included in that group, so I don't want to say anything beyond what my social media reaction was, just because that is what I'm limited to right now. But I will just reiterate, I liked it. There is a lot to love in Wonder Woman. Mm. Gal Gadot, Chris Pine are fantastic. Wow. I, I did find some pacing problems in the second half of the movie, but for everybody on Twitter who's just, I posted that thing, and it's just, oh, you hated it. I said I loved so much about it, and then this, you know, one one negative thing. But, you know, overall, I'm very, very eager to see this movie a second time. So yep. what have you guys taken from the early Twitter reactions you've seen so far? Well, I think it's given me, like, uh, it's relaxed me a little bit. Because, like, uh, like I've said before on the show and on other podcasts, like, my concern was that I felt that Warner Brothers wasn't, in mar wasn't marketing this thing correctly. I didn't like that you didn't see Gal Gadot speaking in a lot of the trailers for extended amounts of time. And so I was concerned that they were trying to hide her acting or hide her, you know, hide her as, a, as, a, as an actress, as a lead in her own film. Mm -hmm. And so it worried me that Chris Pine was the one getting most of the focus or her assistant was getting most of the focus, that British actress who's really funny. And so for me, I was concerned. But reading these, all these uh, reactions, it gives me hope. I sat and talked with Mark Andraker after the Schmoes No Show the other night, and he was just like, he thinks it's the Captain America of... Of the DC universe, like the first, the first one, the first Avenger, and so to me, this gets me excited. It gets me loud. It calms me down. It makes me want to walk into the theater hoping to see an awesome, fun film and enjoy the performances, enjoy the story. And of course, they've withheld something from all the trailers, apparently, from what I'm hearing. So when we, when I see that in the film, hopefully that'll be something that's a great mm -hmm. reveal and an enjoyable experience. So for me, it just gets me excited that I'm going to actually enjoy this DC movie uh, for the first time since man, maybe. Be Man of Steel. Just goes to show that maybe this was a good approach to their yeah. marketing. You know, test the waters first and then slowly let people start to talk about it yeah. because the fact that we've only been able to release early, very basic, limited to 140 character yeah. reactions mm -hmm. is a really nice way to kind of, you know, get the wave rolling. What do you think, David? I'm excited because I think we said this a couple weeks back on Heroes talking about how I think this might be the first movie that <coughs> critics and fans are going to unite, or at least I was hoping that was going to be the case. And it seems like it might be because I think we're all hoping for a great DC film. There's been so much animosity between I think the community and, you know, us critics, you know, we go in thinking like, hey, maybe they're going in there with a negative attitude. Like, I try to go into every movie, no matter what I'm seeing, whether it's a small indie film or a student film that somebody made at USC, one of my mm -hmm. friends made, or something big like Wonder Woman with an open mind. And I just want to have a good time. It doesn't have to be the greatest movie of all time, but as long as it's enjoyable, fun, captures the spirit, that comic book spirit that is Wonder Woman, uh, that's all I'm asking for. It seems like the movie did that from what I'm seeing from the Twitter comments. So mm -hmm. I hope that's the case. And it just makes me more excited. Like, I got my tickets to go see Alien and Covenant tonight. Mm -hmm. I know a lot of people. Ooh. Here, I've already seen that, and I've been talking about that for the last few weeks, so I'm pumped to see that, too. Again, I just I just want to have fun when I go to a movie, no matter yeah. what it is. Yeah. I just want to have fun. Well, just to highlight yeah. one other little bit that I put in my tweet is one of my favorite things about the movie was the fact that it highlights, you know, it highlights hope and positivity, mm -hmm. and even though there's issues elsewhere, yeah. that's something that really kind of 
doesn't fix those other issues, mm. but it, it keeps you engaged and happy, and that goes a long way. And, you know, just to reiterate the point, you know, when you start reading Wonder Woman reviews and there's any negativity in them at all, it's like the, the perfect uh, comparison I can make is my favorite movie, my, my favorite movie of 20, 2016, this is 2017, yeah. was La La Land. I love mm. La La Land to mm. death. But I would say, you know, this scene is better than this scene. That mm. doesn't mean La La Land is a bad movie. So I don't, just try to keep that comparison in mind when you start to read reviews. And maybe it's not 100% positive because that doesn't mean it's a terrible movie by no. any means. So, you know, take, take these really early reviews kind of with a grain of salt. We're going to get more thorough reviews as we creep closer to the release. Wendy, I know you have uh, strong feelings about Wonder Woman. So are you liking these early reactions? I am so happy. First of all, I didn't even know that you saw the movie. Like, you can kept it like really on the DL. So that's <laughs> awesome. Um, and I was like, oh my God, Perry saw the movie. What is she saying? I hope it's all good. And I was just overwhelmed with happiness that everybody's been so positive about it. This is my most anticipated, one of my most anticipated movie of this year. I, in fact, I like the Her Universe fashion uh, Wonder Woman collection dropped and I went and spent $170 on it <laughs> on the day it dropped. I was like, I have to have it all. Um, so this just confirms to me that I'm probably going to go see it in theaters multiple times. I'm so looking forward to this. I loved her in Batman v Superman as Wonder Woman. And I hope um, this will carry her forward to Justice League and it's going to be even better, greater, awesome. All right, so that's it for our discussion on Wonder Woman. But of course, you know, we're getting close to that release. So keep an eye out because I'm sure there's going to be a lot more coverage going forward now. <laughs> Wendy, what is our first official story of the day? Aquaman director James Wan released the first shot of Amber Heard as Mera. Mera will make an appearance in Zack Snyder's Justice League, and he's already released the first shot of her back in October of 2016. Now, compared with the newest look by Wan, it appears we'll be getting a very different take from the director than Snyder's darker palette we've come to expect from his films. Aquaman stars Jason Momoa as Aquaman and is set to hit theaters on December 21st, 2018. Perry, what do you think about this new image of Mera? I like it. I like it a lot. And, you know, it... You point out the most obvious difference between this and the uh, image of her from Justice League that we got, and mm. it's the colors. Colors go a really long way. For some reason, lately, more so than ever, I've kind of been focusing on that in all these big, big blockbuster, huge budget movies I've seen, especially with 3D, because that's one of the things that bothers me most about 3D is that, yeah. you know, they shoot these beautiful movies, and then you put this extra layer over your eyes, and all of a sudden it immediately darkens bright bright vibrant images and I mean look at look at her hair and look at her costume something like that is very eye-catching mm. and it would be a shame to just have that kind of grayed out an entire movie and another thing that really excites me about this is that I get the sense that this if this is the color palette James Wan is running with compared to what we've seen from Zack Snyder that might mean that DC and Warner Brothers are giving these really talented directors that they're finding free, somewhat of a sense of free reign to, you know, make the movie their way and make it in their style mm -hmm. rather than forcing them to stick to exactly what was done before. And, you know, we, we've seen that in other, uh, other franchises elsewhere when new directors come in. And that's an important thing to allow a director to be able to embrace his or her style while also embracing what came before. Because obviously they're making that movie because what came before is popular to a degree. Mm -hmm. So it seems mm -hmm. like this, this is the right step for Juan to be able to take. Roko, what do you think? Yeah, absolutely. I think this is great. What you talk about colors is, is very true. And when you compare it with what we saw, the Zack Snyder stuff, I think this is, once again, this is another step in the right direction. If the Wonder Woman reviews are to be believed, which I think you can, then this is a movement towards, we heard what the fans were saying. We heard what people wanted to see. We are taking our hands off Jeff Johns. This is a kind of, could be symbolic of Jeff Johns' reign in charge of the DCU now, wanting to let these directors, as you said, Perry, kind of express their visions, explore their versions of these characters, mm. and explore the mythology of these characters in their way. And I've said this since the first Justice League trailer, Aquaman, to me, is the shock mm. of it all. He seems to stand out, the one you really want to watch. I think Momoa is doing fantastic work in the limited amount of time that he has on the in those trailers. He is the one that stands out for me. And so for me, this gets me excited. Plus, Amber Heard is an incredibly attractive and beautiful woman and actress. And so you want to put her in things that are going to highlight that because she's already going to bring it as an actress. So you want to highlight her. And I think this is a very sexy outfit, but also a powerful outfit. The green is very strong. It's not a, it's not a muted green. It's a very vibrant, powerful, bright green. And her hair matches that too as well. So it's a great uh, picture to send out. Momoa is already getting highlighted in the, in the Justice League trailer, so he's fine as Aquaman. This is a great thing to introduce mm -hmm. the colors and vibrancy. And I 
I think they're gonna. I think they are making the right direction. And for people who have been like, oh, you guys hate DC, blah 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 blah, they listened, and they're making the adjustments. So that's not wrong. We weren't wrong to have issues with certain things. They're making adjustments and they're letting these directors have free reign. And that's what we want as people who love films and creative films. We want them to have the freedom to do their things. You brought up her as an actress too. That's like yeah, another thing course. that I think we should highlight. She is mm -hmm. an insanely talented actress mm -hmm. that I don't think gets as much credit as she deserves just because of some of the roles she's had in the past. The one role that really made me look at her and say, like, damn, you are talented, yep. is that teeny tiny role she had in The Danish Girl. She had mm. so little screen time mm -hmm. in that yeah. movie and made such a had such a presence and th like she really was like naturally vibrant and yeah. it made it made you want to see more of her in that movie mm -hmm. so i'm excited to see what she does in this role david what are you thinking so far i think uh when jeff john we started doing the new 52 over dc well it's been several years now um jeff johns took control of aquaman the comic book and this costume like roca was saying if you look at it it looks very similar to what jeff johns I think it was Ivan Rice was doing the artwork. I can't remember exactly yeah, yeah, yeah. what was doing the artwork. Mm -hmm. It looks very similar to that. So I'm glad they're embracing that comic book background for them mm -hmm. because I feel like some of these movies miss the mark on, except for outside of Marvel, especially with DC, on what the comic books are. There's so many good stories, as yeah. many of you uh, out there are aware. You've read a lot of these comic books, and you're, you're excited about these stories. Like, hey, how come they just can't take some of these great stories and put them in the movies? It looks like they're starting to do that now. Also, I want to touch on what Perry was saying about directorial freedom. Mm -hmm. I, I hope that they start letting these directors embrace uh, what makes them great directors. Like, if you watch any film out there, any great filmmaker, you watch a Scorsese movie, you watch a Denny Villeneuve movie, they have a certain style and look, you're like, oh, I can tell, or I'm watching a Tarantino film, you can tell. When you watch a Marvel movie, they kind of all have a similar look to them. Well, directors bring their own style, like James Gunn brings his own colorful mm. flair to Guardians of the Galaxy. When you look at the new Thor trailer, it's like they're kind of on the same level in terms of look, because I want that universe to feel similar and feel comfortable like okay I'm, I'm in this world right now I'm in the Marvel Universe but I love it when directors are given free reign to bring their style and their unique look it can still fit in the same universe even if movie to movie looks a little bit different so I hope this is the first sign of that for the yeah. future of DC yeah. all right Wendy what's story number two Fox recently set release dates for Deadpool 2 as well as the new spin-off New Mutants. But the studio also confirmed that the new X that the main X-Men franchise will continue with X-Men Dark Phoenix, which will explore the Dark Phoenix story arc with Sophie Turner's interpretation of the character. Now the question becomes who of the original quartet of Michael Fassbender, Jennifer Lawrence, James McAvoy, and Nicholas Holt will be back for the installment. Speaking recently on Josh Horowitz's podcast, Happy Sad Confused, Fassbender seemed to confirm that he'll be reprising his role as Magneto. When asked if we can expect him to see expect to see him in any of these future X-Men movies, he responded, possibly. Yeah, likely. <laughs> Roka, do you think we'll really see Fassbender <laughs> back on screen as Magneto? Yeah, I think it's certainly possible. I think he he kind of hinted in that podcast that he is going to be part of the Dark Phoenix one, I think, more so than the New Mutants. So, yes, absolutely. And it's a smart move for him as an actor. He can still play a young Magneto. He can still play Magneto like as he progresses to the Ian McClellan version of Magneto. So there's a lot of time and space to bring Fassbender back. And as you know in Hollywood, your career can go up and down at any moment. So you may need that franchise at a certain time that really kind of re reignites people's desire to work with you again. I don't imagine Fassbender will ever fall off that, but you never know. So to me, this is a smart move by him as an actor to keep that possibility afloat and it's certainly when you see the trailer for the gifted they talk about the brother of the Hood mutants they talk about professor x they don't know if they're still around it's supposedly post logan is the rumor and so he could still be have some kind of uh you know kind of appearance there like what we see sometimes on agents of shield where people from the film world come into the tv world so it's certainly possible to keep him alive in this character i can't see him being replaced people love him as magneto mm. so to me this is all smart stuff that he's saying i do think we'll definitely see him back at some point uh because he's just such a beloved part he seems to escape criticism no matter if the movie is good or bad throughout these uh, throughout all of his appearances in the X-Men movies. And there's a reason, because yeah. he, he does deliver really great work yeah. in every single thing that I've seen him in, whether or not I like the movie as a whole, and Apocalypse is probably a good example. He had a couple, I mean, really fantastic mm -hmm. performance scenes. And the, the one main thing I didn't really love about him is towards the end, how they use him, and, yeah. you know, he doesn't really do much in the third act of the film, which I found a little disappointing, but... I want to see more of him in this role. And normally, I would read these kinds of stories and I would see a quote that, like, the gist of the quote was, possibly, yeah, likely. <laughs> normally, I would read that in text and be like, 
calm down, guys. <laughs> Who knows, you know, how he said that or anything. But I listened to that part of the podcast, and that wasn't just, you know, a brush off the question type thing. Also, Josh Horowitz is a very reputable uh, interviewer who has longstanding relationships with these guys. Yeah. And I have a feeling if Fassbender spilled that bit of information to anybody, he would have genuinely given it to Josh. And hearing how he said it, it really, it, it sounded like, like he was sure in his voice. Yeah. And, you know, I don't want to get ahead of myself either and be like, oh, he's definitely in one right. of these movies. But I am inclined to believe that this is the real deal. And I'm definitely buying the story for that reason. And it would be really cool if he went on and went into Dark Phoenix. And then we had McAvoy in New Mutants. Yep. And maybe down the line, they cross paths again. I think it's a great way to start setting things up. What do you think, David? He's being a good team player. He's being a smart advocate for himself. You don't want to burn bridges. Mm -hmm. One of the best advices I ever had as a kid for my dad was, David, the same people you see on the way up, you're going to see on the way down. And I keep living by that day after day because it's like you don't want to, you want to be like, look, I'll do anything. Like, yeah, I'll work on those movies. They're great. Remember when Chastain, Jessica Chastain was supposed to be cast in Iron Man 3. She was offered the role for the, um, the assistant that ended up being bad, mm. you know, Robert Downey Jr. I can't yeah. remember the actress's name. I think she was in... Um, uh, the Prestige. Oh, she's exactly in the Prestige. The same, the British, I think she's British, isn't she? Oh, okay. Yeah, I think so. Anyway, and she turned it down, but she was like, oh, no, no, it's not because I don't want to be in them. Like, I'd love to be in one of those films in the future. It's just that right now my schedule doesn't align right. uh, for me to shoot that, you know, because she wants to have a career. She wants to keep getting work. These people need, you know, I mean, for lack of a better word, they're not poor, but they need paychecks, right? Yeah. So they want to make sure they have those movies lined up for the future. It's just being a smart, like, I'll use a sports analogy. Mm. You're Cristiano Ronaldo, one of the best football players of all time. Every time he talks about Man United, he always respects Man United because that's where he started. That's where he got his kind of his fame. And he's like, look, maybe I'll go back there one day. Maybe he never will, yeah. but he wants to be a good spokesperson for that because he's like, hey, he's a good guy. He still respects us. Maybe we'll bring him back and pay him more millions of dollars. Sure. So it's just smart. It's just being smart. You got yeah. the best advice growing up. It was good <laughs> advice from my dad. I still remember that. that. I remember that when I was that a kid. He told me that when I was a kid. I still remember that advice. And yeah. breakfast is the most important meal of the day. Breakfast <laughs> is the most important meal of the day. Is it, is it now? Is it why I, I feel a little it sick because I skipped yeah. breakfast today? Make yourself, go ahead and microwave some eggs like, like Perry does. <laughs> hey. 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 Sorry. You, See? Wait. You know what? That's a perfect opportunity to plug behind the scenes because <laughs> things are changing. You're going to want to watch that episode tomorrow. <laughs> All right. Before we talk about eggs anymore, let's move on to buy or sell the portion of the show when we get to say whether we buy or sell a specific story. So, Wendy, what is the first one up? A24 has unveiled the first trailer for the upcoming crime thriller, Good Time. The film comes from heaven knows what filmmakers Josh and Benny Safdie and stars Robert Pattinson as a robber who finds himself desperate for cash when a botched robbery lands his younger brother in jail. The film also stars Benny Safdie, Barkhad Abdi, and Jennifer Jason Lee and opens in theaters on August 11th. David, buy or sell this new trailer for good time. I buy it. I buy it for a few reasons. One, I'm buying Rob Pattinson right now. Uh, there's, a, I think I mentioned this a few weeks ago. There's a movie out right now called The Lost City of Z starring Charlie Hunnam. I know Charlie Hunnam's in King Arthur, so it's taking a lot of attention. But go see, if you want to see Charlie Hunnam, if you're a friend of Sons of Anarchy, a fan, go see Lost City of Z. He's excellent in there. Rob Pattinson is actually almost unrecognizable. I mean, he's got this thick beard, the same beard you kind of see he has in the trailer. He looks really, really extra skinny. And he's fantastic. He's becoming a chameleon. Ever since Twilight, I know he's Twilight. He's, you know, our Pats, you know, and Case 2, all that hoopla but now he's come to a place where he's just becoming just a very good actor you know he broke out he needed that he needed twilight to get him that recognition that fame and now he can do these smaller indie films where he's really just killing it he's a fantastic actor I'd also by it because it's a24 a24 mm -hmm. look at their resume of films that they've picked up at festivals and just develop themselves. They're one of the smartest uh, companies out there. They just, I mean, I think what it comes at night, Perry, I believe A24 picked that yep. up. Mm -hmm. If any movie by A24, The Witch last year, if you see A24 before the uh, trailer starts, mm -hmm. that's a movie you should go see. I, I, I'll buy A24 and definitely buy an R. Pattinson. Yeah, that's, that's like one thing that keeps coming up every time we see an A24 mm -hmm. trailer is that a lot of folks will say, if it's A24, right. I'm gonna see it. Yeah. But, you know, just be warned, not everything <laughs> is it comes at night or the witch or sure. or green room or something like that they they do a lot of really mm -hmm. offbeat type movies and i think this trailer kind of strikes the perfect balance between you know giving you enough of a of a meaty story with a familiar face that makes you say like i will give that a shot mm -hmm. but then towards the end you kind of get that almost like a trippy sense from it that yeah. seems like something really really different and not particularly mainstream but that might have been the smartest way to market this because i am buying this trailer big time I am a big fan of Robert Pattinson, and I know that that is a that's a, a tough thing to be able to admit post Twilight, because you know even though that did launch his career, 
it is something that he's going to be stuck with for the rest mm. of his life. And I don't even think all the Twilight movies are bad. I don't think he was all that bad in it, but some of them are bad. Yep. <laughs> some of them are pretty mm. bad. Mm. And there's no doubt that every time, you know, a, a grown adult hears Twilight, they're going to roll their eyes. But he is a damn talented actor. I mean, just a couple that come to my mind is... Uh, I was about to say Rover? Fault, Fault in Our Stars. The Rover, yeah, the Rover, Rover is yeah. very good. Maps to the Stars. I didn't oh, want to say yeah. Fault in Our Stars because <laughs> Maps to the Stars is a completely <laughs> different movie. Yeah. Another movie where he had a small role and he's really good. I'm dying to see Lost City as a... Mm -hmm. I mean, it's, it's about time it's that worth I it. finally yeah. get to see that. But this thing looks really different. He looks like he's really going to show what he's capable of in it and I'm excited for it. Roka, what do you think? I think you made great points, Barry. I, I, I wouldn't say I'm a Robert Pattinson fan, but I've definitely, I'm definitely i enjoying his post-work <laughs> since Twilight. Like I'm enjoying the work that he's done a Cosmo nobody talks about Cosmopolis mm. enough and I enjoyed him in Cosmopolis yes was it a bit of a jumbled mess at times sure but he was good mm. I think him and Kristen Stewart are the two people to, uh, to to move away from the Twilight thing and are able to establish themselves but Robert is doing it with no drama you know, mm. and that's the thing with Kristen. You have the drama about the cheating and all this stuff with the director. Like, there's all stuff going on, right? But we, and her interviews. But Robert just kind of stays the course and does his work and does his solid work. He likes doing stuff out of the mainstream. You know, why would you take a movie like Cosmopolis or Map to the Stars? Like, why would you? It's because you want to establish your credibility as an actor. You have that Twilight money. You don't have to rush out and do a bunch of franchises. You don't have to. Mm. You're, if you have an actor's sensibilities, these are the things you look for. And you can see this in this film. This is another example. He's almost unrecognizable. His accent is on point. And what he's doing in this relationship with his brother and the way the trailer is cut, I so buy this because it puts you in this world almost immediately. We see this in Out of the Furnace. We see this in Triple Nine. We see this, I, I thought, in The Drop with Tom Hardy. Like these films that are quieter, smaller films, that are city films that get into the grittiness. And you can sense this here. The, the, the brother, his brother is one of the co-directors of the movie. His, the, his brother in the movie is one of the co-directors right. of the movie. And he has a... It's just an amazing voice, an amazing look, and so you know this is darker and darker than 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 what you would think a smaller story. Mm -hmm. There's, it seems to be rippling out from as the trailer goes on. So you know this is a bigger story. And me personally, it's so awesome to see Jennifer Jason Lee start to get these roles again because she was one of these actresses from the '80s that was always better than a Brat Pack or a Rat, whatever they were called. She was always stronger, had more, but like Laura Dern, she always had more to her mm -hmm. than just these these like lighthearted teenage films. There was always something more to her. And so I love that she was in uh, um, Hateful Eight. And so I love that she's getting these things again because she's a very yeah. gritty actress and I love it. Yeah. All right, let's move on to another trailer. Wendy, what's next? Warner Brothers and New Line Cinema have released a new Red Band trailer for the upcoming comedy, The House. Directed by Neighbors co-writer Andrew J. Cohen, marking his directorial debut, the film stars Will Ferrell and Amy Poehler as a married couple who, after losing their daughter's college fund, becomes desperate to earn it back. As a result, they team up with their neighbor, played by Jason Manzoukas, to start an illegal casino in their basement. The film also stars Nick Kroll and Allison Tolman and opens in theaters on June 30th. Perry, buy or sell the latest trailer for The House. <sighs> it's, hard <to> make, <laughs> it's hard to make a decision on this one, just because, okay, I'm is going... It, is it really well, hard? No, I'm going to sell this trailer, <laughs> yes. but... I kind of like the concept and I want it to work. And, you know, the part of my brain that wants to like it so badly keeps saying that, oh, if I'm not laughing out loud because of the jokes in the trailer, maybe because that means that they're saving the good stuff for the movie. <laughs> I don't know. That's kind of wishful thinking. I don't think this this trailer is that great. I got the gist of the story in the first one. And that's why I I believe I had bought the first trailer because... I like the story. I think that is a very funny spin on how parents have to pay the enormous fees to send a kid to college. Mm. I, and I like uh, I like the two of them, too. Amy Poehler and Will Ferrell can, can be great when they're given the right material to work with. This new trailer, however, it's like I already knew the premise, and then none of the jokes made me laugh. So mm. I think I have to sell it. Roka? Oh, I sell this with... Every, I'm going to take all your money and sell it. Like, it's just... it's. I, I, to me, this is a movie ten years too late for everybody involved in this movie because it because the humor they're doing is humor that we've moved past, and so it's not funny. Like the cutting off, it's so obvious the cutting off of the finger. It's so obvious that's a dummy hand. It's so why would you put a croc? <laughs> These are people that have raised an intelligent girl. <laughs> like it's just so dumb. These are people that have raised an intelligent girl, and uh, Will Ferrell can't tell the difference between fifty million and fifty thousand. What the. F 
the f are we talking about? It just seems so stupid that they're asking you as an audience to go, hey, hey, dummies, come in here and watch this dumb comedy. Like it just bothers me because we want more from our comedy, and they're capable of more intelligent, funny, layered comedy, especially Amy Poehler. Good God, Amy Parks and Rec is one of the most intelligent sitcoms ever done. And so there's there was more. I think there was a better film to be made here, and I think what you say is right, Perry. There's a it was, the concept is great. The execution looks absolutely ridiculous and stupid, and they got a bunch of their friends together, paid them to do these comedic things, and got them some health insurance. It just bothers me overall some because health insurance. because I want <laughs> because I want these I want these films. We need comedies like in this time now in our day we need comedies and so i want good comedies and this if the red band trailer can't make me laugh then i know the film itself is not going to make me laugh at all you know and they like her they're throwing up in the container store like all of that was just like we this is 10 years ago this is dumb and dumber comedy and it, they they could have done something a little more poignant a little more uh, hilarious a li just just funnier all around so really that damn croc broke all yeah, right i mean <laughs> what are we talking about <laughs> david what'd you think I thought, because we were talking about, you know, dating before this. We had a big conversation about dating and oh, things like that. About. Um, <laughs> yeah. And uh, this, to me, felt like a great, I'm going to buy this because it felt to me like a great Friday night, you know, at, at the house date night movie, right? <laughs> I mean, you can watch this, just kind of enjoy it, a little popcorn, you know, next to the lady or, or, or guy, you know, whatever your preference is. Whatever your preference is, yeah, you know, or both, yeah, you know, depending on where you live. Um, where it seems like a great Friday night, you know? <laughs> I, I don't you know. I, I, I would like to watch this on a Friday night. I'm not going to go see it in the theater. I would definitely rent this. I love Amy Poehler from Park. And Rex, so yeah. I would see this on a Friday night because it'll pave the way to a very successful relationship. <laughs> What's you wrong guys, with the friend? <laughs> right, you know, like, what what does where you live matter if you're going to be with well, a I'm, I'm just saying. As long as Relax. you watch the movie while wearing Crocs. <laughs> All right, Wendy, what's our next story? <laughs> according to a report, I can't. Okay, according to a report from Deadline, Real Steel director Sean Levy is reteaming with Amblin for a sci fi action drama entitled The Fall. The movie centers on a recently divorced couple who must make the dangerous trip from the city back home to their kids during an alien invasion. Roca, buy or sell Sean Levy directing The Fall? Oh, absolutely. I buy this like crazy. I think Sean Levy is... I mean, he produced. He was one of the producers on The Rival. So to, to me, he's done so much wor fantastic work that already lets you uh, be excited for him to direct this movie. And the concept is great. Getting back home during Alien Invasion. So the Alien Invasion is almost secondary to them trying to get back home. It's Their, cons their goal is not to stop the Alien Invasion or to fight off the Alien Invasion. Their goal is, I got to get home to my kids. And I think that's a brilliant thing. And Sean Levy does a great job of taking these like larger concepts and putting mm -hmm. them into a smaller world and making them still as powerful as if they was in a bigger palette. And so I love that about him. And I think he's the right choice for something like this. He's doing so many things, though. He's attached to the Starman remake. You know, he's doing the Uncharted stuff. So there's there's so much. He that directed he, episodes of Stranger Things. Yeah, Stranger mm. Things, right. He's got so much that he's dancing around with that I hope that this comes out with the right attention to detail that he is so gifted at doing as a director and as a producer as well. So to me, I absolutely buy this. I think he's the right choice for something like this. I want to see the casting, and I want to see a trailer before I 1,000% buy it, but I certainly 100% buy it right now. Yeah, at this stage, I'm going to buy it, too. Yeah. I, I love this concept. This is going to make me sound like a big weirdo, but, I mean, really, haven't you ever thought about it? Like, what if aliens invaded, or what if there was sure. a natural disaster? Like, what, what yeah. would you do? And now that I am on the opposite side of the country compared to my whole entire family, it's like, would I hang here and try to survive, or would I go yeah. back to them? I, I actually do think about that a little too much, which is why this concept appeals to me. And and Sean Levy needs more credit. I know mm -hmm. how some people feel about those Night at the Museum movies just because they are made for kids and some are better than others, but I want to say that almost every single one of those has has at least something that everybody sure. can enjoy. And Absolutely. and one of the most important things about those movies is, you know, it's the, the heart. The mm -hmm. heart is always there. The characters mm -hmm. are kind of lovable, most of them at least. Some of them are a little annoying. But yeah. he did great work with that. And I think he really did a, he did a great job with Real Steel. There's mm -hmm. so many things on his resume where... I don't know if he gets enough credit as as a really talented director who I think could work really well with this kind of material. David, what are you thinking about this one? I'm definitely buying this. I think you get you get right at the point about and you too, Rock, about the the heart of it. You know, when any big natural disaster movie, it's not about. I mean, it is about the disaster, but it's about the people involved in it. That's what when The Walking Dead is at its best. Yeah, it can be one of the greatest shows on television when it's doing 
when it's talking about what's going on with the human condition and the human story, when all these hor horrific things are going on with zombies attacking, people dying, what are the humans? Like, what are they going through? What does that do to their relationships? Yeah. That photo right there, no, that's not like a production photo necessarily, but I think about The Road. Yeah, The Road. You know, Cormac McCarthy's great <sighs> novel, The Road. And yeah, post-apocalyptic world, but it's, it's about a, you know, a man and a boy. You know, it's about their relationship. Or you look at Battlestar Galactica, it's always something, you have to focus on the humans and what they're mm -hmm. doing amidst all this chaos. And that's what makes it interesting. And I think Levy is a perfect guy to do that, so I'm definitely going to buy this. All mm -hmm. right. Looks like we got one more buy or sell to hit. Wendy, what is it? <clears throat> 20th Century Fox has released the first images from The Greatest Showman. The original musical is based on the life of P.T. Barnum and follows him from his poverty-stricken childhood to the launch of his first circus in New York. Hugh Jackman stars as Barnum alongside Zac Efron, who plays Barnum's business partner. The Greatest Showman is scheduled to hit theaters on December 25th. David, buy or sell the first images from The Greatest Showman. I buy it. You know, Hugh Jackman's very talented. He can sing and he can dance. I mean, we know, uh, you know, if you saw Les Miserables, he was fantastic in that. I believe I was very fortunate. When I was in grad school out here. I had Ralph Winter, the producer, uh, co-teach one of my, my classes on film. And it was really cool because he told us, so he, he was producing all the original X-Men films. And he told us the story of how they actually found Hugh Jackman. I believe he was doing a production of Oklahoma somewhere. Uh -huh. So they found him doing his song and dance and everything. And this big, huge, you know, 6'4 Australian dude who's just got so much charisma and talent. I mean, you could see it even before he was Wolverine. So the fact he's going to be P.T. Barnum, you know, one of the best showmen on earth of all time. I mean, that, that's perfect. I think he's in the perfect role for that. I mean, I love Hugh Jackman can play gruff Wolverine. And he can be in Les Miserables with have a beautiful voice. And he can also be P.T. Barnum in another musical. He's, he's such a diverse actor. I, I love watching him. I'll always watch Hugh Jackman, so I'm definitely buying this. Yeah, I'm buying <clears throat> this as well. And it seems like the perfect Christmas release, too. Oh, yeah. Mm -hmm. I mean, this is, this is a, smart, a smart casting choice and also a smart decision when they, when they made the choice to actually make this a musical. Mm -hmm. I think that's a really intriguing decision and something that really suits Jackman's abilities, obviously. These pictures have a, a very Moulin Rouge vibe which mm -hmm. I like and you yeah. know that's going to be a given when it takes yeah. place in a theater of mm -hmm. any sorts and has costumes like that but this thing looks so damn good I can't wait to see some more material from this movie I'm excited for Zac Efron I really like the idea of him doing something different we were talking about it um, earlier this week when he was cast in something else it's just like I know he's he's doing really well with movies like you know Neighbors mm -hmm. I haven't seen Baywatch yet mm -hmm. so I don't know how great he's playing he is Ted that. Bundy isn't he? yeah, yeah. That, yeah. that's the, he that's the movie Bundy, yeah. and mm -hmm. you know he, he has had a string of of uh, studio comedies lately, and even though he's good in those, I want to see I want to yeah. see him really sink his teeth into a role, or or to do something a little bigger and different like this. So, I am really pumped about this. The only thing that I'm kind of on the fence about is I think that they were saying. I wish I had written the quote down that that the music is going to have like a little more of like a, a popular like mm -hmm. pop vibe, mm -hmm. which seems mm -hmm. like, like a, a Hamilton. Weird, maybe I wonder. It seems like a weird fit to me. But we're t <laughs> we're talking about the 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 duo behind uh, La La Land's mm -hmm. lyrics. So if they're handling it, then I'm going to give them the benefit of the doubt. That's the only thing in this whole project, though, that seems a little strange and mm -hmm. like it, it's either going to work really well or it's not. So mm -hmm. I guess we got to wait and see for that one. Roka, what do you think? Well, I, I love the images because they sh highlight the cast, right? It's it's Hugh Jackman, it's uh, uh, Michelle Williams, it's uh, Zendaya, Zac Efron, and you're right. F I saw Baywatch, obviously, he's talking about the mm. premiere. Uh, Zac is great in the movie. Everybody acting wise is great in the movie except for a couple of people, and Zac is fantastic. Mm -hmm. I love Zac at the beginning. Zac all through his process in the movie, he is great, and Zac. Zach's abs, sweet Mary, mother oh of God. <laughs> I mean, when you guys, it, you guys will know when you go see it. There's one scene. His abs are out of control, literally. It's like Donkey Kong on his abs. You can just see all these things. So to me, it's just amazing. It's, it's, I mean, like it's the levels. You know what I'm so, <laughs> climb the ladder. Like, yeah, yeah, you climb the ladder. Like, yeah. this is amazing. But he's just. It, uh, but I like what he's doing. Look, I'm. I. You know, I didn't. I hated those high school musical things, and I think they're ridiculous. But Zach, once again, like Robert Pattinson, he is doing his own way of breaking out of these things, which is doing these like comedies that have heart. Mm. Neighbors has heart. His struggle in Neighbors. You believe him when he's having those moments with his fellow fraternity brothers, having to grow up. Even in Neighbors 2, when he's helping them out now battle the sorority, um, he's the one that stands out over Chloe Grace Moretz. And Moretz is the more accomplished actor, in my opinion. But he kind of stands out a little bit more than her in that movie. And I think with this, this shows, once again, another step forward. And Jackman, of course. Jackman mm. is just a fantastic showman performer. Mm. One of the best energies working today. You obvious, When you see him interviewed, when you see him in person, when you watch his movies, the man has a great, warm, 
uh, uh, energy that you want to be around. And so to me, I'm happy he's he's chosen for this. It reminds me a little bit of those old school classic films like Yankee Doodle Dandy, where James Cagney was doing uh, was portraying that biopic, and he was doing that, and so he was dancing and singing. So he was taking advantage of, the, of his strengths. And I like this idea of um, what the director said, which I wanted to do the quote. If you're going to call it the greatest showman on earth, you should play to your strengths and we should make it a musical mm -hmm. is what he said. Mm -hmm. And he said, that ridiculous remark cost me seven years of my life. Mm -hmm. So that lets you know how much time <laughs> they've spent in creating this. So for me, the images are very well on road. You're right, but I think this might be a better movie in mm -hmm. the end. I like the sound of that. All right, before we move on to our mailbag question today, I want to remind you that we are going to take some live Twitter questions at the end of the show. So start sending those over to the Twitter account right now. Wendy's going to pick a few good ones out. We also have more stuff to plug. Uh, a little later today, there's a new Schmodown going up. It is Christian versus the Beast Bibiani. <laughs> it's going to be a great match. Mm -hmm. Then also be sure this weekend to look out for two Collider mailbag episodes, one Saturday, one Sunday, and then, of course, Collider behind the scenes and a whole lot of eggs in that episode. Oh. Yeah. <laughs> and as always, we have a brand new episode of Jeremy Johns' show, Awesome Tacular, going up today. We're going to have a link in the description section, so check that out. Verizon, go 90. All right, that's it for plugs. So let's move <laughs> on to the mailbag. All right, here we go. Kyle writes, hey, Collider crew. I was digging through Peter Berg's IMDb page and found that he directed Battleship. I personally thought this movie was terrible and mm -hmm. was surprised to see he directed it. What directors have been killing it recently but have some hidden bombs in the past? Anyone come to mind for you guys? Well, there's so many. I mean, when you say killing it recently, what does that mean? Are, like, are you saying they're making good? Like, you could say Ridley Scott did The Martian within uh, the last couple of years, but... Some of his, like, Exodus Gods and Kings was mm. absolutely horrible. Mm -hmm. And so you, you have people who are working. Woody Allen's still consistently working, and Scoop is one of the worst movies I've ever seen. Uh, you have these directors who are consistently working, but they have these terrible films. Because you're going to have them. You're going to go off base. The Coen Brothers' Lady Killers, some people absolutely hate that. Some people don't like Intolerable Cruelty. So those are those things. But, Cohen, but the Coen Brothers do consistently fantastic work. With Wes Anderson, to me, Darjeeling Limited is one of the most annoyingly boring films I've ever had to sit through. Yet I love everything Wes has done this side of Bottle yeah. Rocket. And I just, so to me, it's it's a matter of like, what are we talking about? Because these current, these current directors have to have these you, most of the time they have these bad movies in their backgrounds or in their resume because it kind of is what they're using to establish themselves and you can sometimes see through a bad movie to see a director's technique you know? I'm going to go for the obvious one M. Night Shyamalan oh yeah there, there you go there's I so mean, many <laughs> The Happening Lady in the Water Last Airbender and that's oh, yeah. just to name a few pretty bad movies and then all of a sudden he comes back with the visit. Yep. And that was just one of the best surprises. I was so happy mm -hmm. when that movie came out and and it was scary but it was fun and playful. If you have not seen The Visit, give that a shot and then of course we, we have Split. Right. Yeah. I mean Split has put him on another level all over again just because one that is a good movie in and of itself and what it has opened the door to. So, I think mm -hmm. he's kind of like the perfect example and and for David just to throw in a little TV example, Ooh. one of my least favorite movies of like the past 10 years was Silent Hill Revelations 3D. Oh. It was directed by Michael J. Bassett. <laughs> And I thought it, it was just, that is a god-awful movie. That is one of the worst movies. And then he came back and he directed episodes of Ash vs. Evil Dead. And mm. they were some of my favorite episodes of the entire show. So I want to look out for him doing some more good things. You got anyone, David? Yeah. Um, it, I mean, it's really tough for directors to have a career where it's like, not everything's perfect, but everything's pretty highly rated. I mean, Tarantino's been fortunate, you know? Mm. Obviously, he's very talented. He's been fortunate. Nolan has had that, you know, great, he's, you know, he's been making these Batman movies, and then the studio has let him make Interstellar and Inception mm -hmm. and things like that. Um, yeah, Ridley Scott's one. Blomkamp, I know he's younger, so he doesn't oh. have the resume that a Ridley yeah, Scott does, but because I, I, I'm a big defender of Elysium, I really enjoyed Elysium. I love District 9. Uh -oh. Uh -oh. oh, here we go. Here comes, oh, Roka. No. Here comes a Roka rant. Um, but Chappie was problematic. It, was, it wasn't very good. Was it? It wasn't very good. <laughs> but hey. Elysium wasn't problematic? Huh? Elysium wasn't problematic. It's it got issues, but I still... Elysium's I, I, Elysium's more problematic than Chappie. Hey, hey, yes. hey, at least more he, than Chappie, Elysium is problematic. <laughs> All right, I don't agree with that. But anyway, <laughs> hey, this is my time to talk. It's my <laughs> time to talk. <laughs> time to talk. <laughs> my time to talk. <laughs> so, yeah, Blomkamp, because I want to see what he's going to do next. We thought, thought he was going to make those alien movies, but Ridley Scott said those are dead, so no. let's see what he does next. Well, though, if, if, if the reviews of Alien Covenant are to be believed, maybe don't kill Neil Blomkamp just yet. No. It's at 75% of runs. Yeah, yeah but some people are saying 
saying they're not. Uh, I've, oh. It's already. Most of it, they're not. They've as, already greenlit the next movie. Yeah, but it's a lot of people are telling me from who've gone to see it that it's not as good as they thought it was going to be. That's more of a horror movie. Who are you talking to? Uh, Mark oh. and Draco, William Bidiani. Um, never heard of him. Yeah. I'm seeing it. I'm seeing. I'm seeing it tomorrow. I'll, or tonight, I'll so. disagree with that. I've yeah. I've seen it, it, and even again, there's it another. Made good money there's another. Yeah. It, it did, yeah. I, and it made a it made a so good deal. It made a good deal last night too. I don't I don't think review wise or box office wise. Covenant is going to stop Ridley yeah. Scott from making more movies, He's and good. you know it's the it's same thing I brought up with uh, yeah. with it's Wonder Woman yeah. before. It's, it's, it's oh, oh wow! <laughs> oh, thank you, Roka. Oh, that was like the nicest is. thing you've ever oh. done for me. That's uh, not but, true. Well, okay, that's, not that's true. That's not true. Critics that's not true. Well, well, going <laughs> that was the <a> nice <laughs> thing I did for you. Um, but going back to to <laughs> Alien, um, I was comparing it a little to to Wonder Woman, where it's like. You know, some parts work really, really well, but there's bits that don't. That mm -hmm. doesn't mean the, the movie overall is god awful. I just, right. it's the fly here. Yeah. Damn it. I knew it was going to come and ruin the show Brendel at some point. Fly. Oh, yeah. oh, I wish. That'd I be wish. so cool. But, no, you don't but, wish Brendel Fly to be here. Are you nuts? That's exciting. Oh, my gosh. <laughs> All right, we're like way what off track. What are we track. talking about right but now? But to, to reel it back in and give yeah. Alien Covenant some credit, mm -hmm. yeah. parts of it don't work as well as others. Damn it. Um, it's all right. But it's that pink <laughs> it's, it's jacket like in my face. It's your pinky Tuscadero <sighs> jacket. Yeah. Hey, you like it's my a great jacket, looking jacket. Oh, yeah, well, thanks, yeah. guys. Mm -hmm. <laughs> well, back to Alien for like the fourth time. <laughs> Parts don't work. A lot of it is really damn good right. and could pave the way to some good things going good. forward. And given what Ridley Scott has said recently about Neil, Neil Blomkamp's Alien, right. I will just bet against it until the day I die that yeah. Neil Blomkamp's Alien will never happen. No. But I really do want. <laughs> well, I just landed on her head. It's on my head. Yeah. <laughs> just like shake your head. It's on. No, it's still there. It's still there. Oh, it's ball. It's no. got a lot. Of, just I can't. Oh my goodness. All right. Can I, I think... throw in two more directors? Here we go. Okay. Brad Bird, Tomorrowland. A lot of people didn't like Tomorrowland. Brad Bird's a good director. And the uh, um, Lovely Bones. Peter Jackson. <laughs> Peter. That's Peter a good Lovely example. Bones. People didn't like Lovely Bones. Peter Jackson directed that. Oh. So, yeah. uh, all, right. all right. I think we we need to move on to yes, Twitter questions do. now. <laughs> All right, uh, Wendy, what do we got up first? That fly is like owning you it's, guys it's over It's all there. over the place right now. <laughs> all right, this uh, Twitter question comes from Jamie Habits, who writes, Breaking news, uh, David Ayer in early talks to direct Scarface. What are your thoughts? Star oh, boy. Scarface? Yeah. Scarface. You didn't oh, know Scar about that. I said Starface. Yes. Like, yeah. No, 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 Starface. Scarface. Oh. Scarface. Yes. Yeah, yeah. I, I think I sequel? think I'm open what? to it. It's a, a reimagining. That's oh, what they're calling what's it. What's the matter with you? Well, Pacino's alive. They could like they're not gonna do a. He died at the end oh, of the. Yeah, Why are they gonna right. do a it's, sequel, David? <laughs> Spoilers. Spoiler well, alert. But it, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I don't know. Yeah. Yeah. Got it. Right. <laughs> oh, we're off the rails all of a sudden. We were, we were so laser focused for a while. Hopefully, they get somebody who is not an Italian man playing somebody oh, from Cuba. Nice I show. mean, Pacino was great oh, though. Oh, wait, Pacino wait, was great. Wait, oh, here it comes. Here we go. Here it comes. Right. So David comes. has an issue with Italian man playing here comes. a Cuban, but he's got no problem with the only white guy in the movie in a Mexican uh, uh, barrio being chosen to be the savior of the country in Elysium. That's no problem. Let's go find the only white guy in an entire barrio At of least Mexicans. they had Ridiculous. Hispanic people in the movie. Ridiculous. At least it oh it should have been Diego Luna. Wow. All right, anyway, where were we? <laughs> Wait, what? You know, I am part Cuban, bruh. Bruh. Yeah. <laughs> are, you, are you caught up on this, on this Scarface story at no, all? No, Di Diego know, Luna is, is attached, and it's a oh, Coen Brothers awesome. script, so Great. it's... It's but they a, won't direct. It's a type Ayers of package. Yeah. Um, oh, wow. Well, it's not. It's not complete, according to the Variety article I'm looking at right now. The headline is that <clears> he's <throat> in talks for it. Mm, so he's great. I, I would be surprised if the deal didn't go through. And it's you know, yeah. and I know some people are sour on him from Suicide Squad, That's but. I, I like quite a few of his movies. I, you know, yeah. I like Fury a lot. Fury, I watch Fury and re yeah, that Fury movie great. way too often. So I think he could mm -hmm. be a good fit. He definitely has a, a specific style yeah. that, that makes me a little nervous just because, I, you know, it's, it's coming off Suicide Squad, I think, that has me a little apprehensive. And not because of how I felt about that movie as a whole, just because that was a very specific style mm -hmm. of yeah. movie. And, and that is not appropriate for a Scarface movie whatsoever. But when I think back to Fury, I'm like, this could be a good pairing. Fury, End of Watch. Fantastic of watch. movies that David Ayer has directed. So I don't blame him for Suicide Squad all at all. I blame Warner Brothers. I blame them bringing in a trailer house to cut that movie. Ridiculous. David Ayer, I would have loved to have seen David Ayer's Suicide Squad with anybody putting their hands on it and see what he would have done. Because mm. David does great, great work in exploring the gritty complexities of relationships and the darkness that can occur. And so I would have loved to have seen his version of Suicide Squad. Fury does that. Fury does that. Those guys... 
talk to each other as men talk to each other during war. And I, it was one of the most realistic portrayals mm. of what that's like. It's hard. It's ball busting. It, out of nowhere, it, you've got vulnerability. And out of nowhere, there's darkness and real edgy stuff that people uh, uh, succumb to in those moments. So to me, him directing Scarface, it's the first time that I've heard news about this that I'm super excited about a remake of it. Because Scarface, to me, is untouchable. And yes, it is a remake of a Paul Mooney one from the 20s. But still, right. I, I thought it was Isn't untouchable. Cagney? Was Cagney in there? No, no, it was Paul Mooney. Paul no, Mooney, Cag okay, yeah. Cagney's Public Enemies. That's Public Enemies, yeah. I, I, I love Scarface. Face. As much as I pick on Pacino's accent, I'm still excited to yeah, see yeah, this. Yeah. I would definitely see it. I hope David Ayer gets it because he is, like he said, end of watch, Fury. Yeah, it's great. Stuff. That, that fly still there, Perry. It still looks wrong. I'm sorry. I know. It just wants to hang out. It's with not me. going anywhere. It might be my coffee. Mm -hmm. Oh, well. All right. Give me another Twitter question one day. <laughs> All right. This one actually comes from the chat room. Sarah Smith writes Is the projected $40 million opening weekend for The Mummy, which has a budget of $125 million, good or bad? Um. If we were just talking about domestic box office, I'd be a little concerned, but I think this is one of those ones where they're going to have to rely on international more so than mm. anything. And you know, Cruise I I've can do it. Tom Cruise can pull that international. I, yeah, yeah, you would you would think, and you would think just like the mummy and the idea that this is going to pave the way to a bigger franchise. And it's not just Cruise; it also has Russell Crowe. So I think that might be you know the group of people that they need to actually make this thing pop overseas, but. I, yeah, I think those those forty million dollar projections are pretty on point. I have a feeling that's where it's going to land. I I want to take umbrage with this because Snyder. I saw I read Snyder's tweet as I was walking, and he said the same thing. Forty million is what they're projecting. I think it's going to be sixty. I really do. I think Tom Cruise. As we get closer, Tom Cruise. He just has that ability, and I love every one of the trailers has been good. I like this idea of Russell Crowe. They're launching a universe, so who knows? Maybe I'm an idiot, but I just feel like 60 seems more believable to me uh, because I think people are going to go, and people from word of mouth are going to go because it looks like it's going to be a fantastic film. Mm. Well, maybe if and the it, reviews are really good. Yeah, yeah, another I mean, Mission that, Impossible that type That could be vibe. the thing. Yeah. What do you yeah. think, David? I think, I think it's going to do well. I agree with Roka. I like the $60 million projection. I mean, we always talk about how the projections are low anyway. They always yeah. lowball it because they want it to go, oh, we didn't know it was going to do this. This well, right. I think the international money is going to be good too. Oh, I think definitely. it's going to make its money back. I don't think it's going to be a flop at all. Yeah, I hope so because yeah. I want to see those other monster movies they have in the mm -hmm. works because a lot of them sound really, really exciting. And people like monster movies, so I think they'll want to go see if this is a good movie or not. Yeah. yeah. All right. What's our next Twitter question, Wendy? This one comes from Chris Johnson, who writes, "What is the benefit slash purpose behind studios staging the release of critic social media reactions and then proper reviews?" Well, I think uh, I think Wonder Woman is probably a great example right now. It's I mean, look look at what's happened when when you limit people to Twitter reactions, they can only say so much. And it's, I think this kind of model only works when the general response is positive. Mm -hmm. It's like they they knew people walking out of those screenings they, they dug the movie. Right. So it's like okay kick the buzz off right now. Then all of a sudden, you know, a week or two later, you lift the embargo and you have full blown uh, reviews coming out at mm -hmm. you. And if those are positive again, then you get like that last little wave from a major marketing push. And before you know it, it has hit such a crescendo that that's probably all anybody's gonna be talking about. Mm -hmm. And I, I do hope, hope that that's the case with Wonder Woman. Mm -hmm. I think it's controlling the hype. And they're doing a good job of it. It's smart marketing, you know. Instead of just putting all there at once, like you said, Perry, they're kind of this little bit here, a little bit of Twitter. Mm -hmm. Then the big reviews come out, and more TV advertising, and all that, and the posters. I think it's just, it's smart. Yeah, they're just slowing the roll. Yeah, it's interesting that they're le letting this, they're lifting this embargo this early because Baywatch right. you can't even talk about till the twenty third, and that comes out like two days later. Well, the thing so like to so so go back to Alien Covenant. Alien Covenant dropped their embargo two weeks ahead. Yeah, mm -hmm. they had yeah. confidence in it. Yeah, they had confidence. Well, I guess so. And and this is uh, my concern is lifting the embargo this early. There'll be people who want to undercut that embargo and want to. Like want to want to push back against these positive reviews, and that concerns me. And so mm -hmm. I'd rather have like positive crescendo all the way, like you just said, Perry, all the way to the movie premiering on June second, than enjoying that experience. So that's my only worry about it. But it looks like it's really smart right now. What it's ninety two percent. Uh, of people who want to go see this movie on the Fandango poll. So that's a great, great number to have. Yeah. All right. Let's get another one in. All right. This one comes from Solid Snake, who writes, who is the most iconic character? Vader, Han Solo, Balboa, Batman, Superman, or Indiana Jones? <laughs> Holy oh, crap. Oh, jeez. That's a lot of choices. Yeah. Um, I'm, I'm actually going to go ahead and say a confident Vader. Mm -hmm. I mean, just look at how they used Vader in Rogue One. I feel like, so with the Star Wars uh, standalone movies, even though it's still Star Wars and it carries the Star Wars brand, 
that movie needed Vader to get a certain percentage of people mm. in those seats. And you know, I was even talking to my little cousins who were just exploring Star Wars, and they were telling me because they, well, I had gone to visit them, and that night they were watching Rogue One for the mm. first time. And I'm like, when you guys are done watching, you you let me know what you think. And their response was like, oh, Darth Vader, because they really did in in the original trilogy. They got really caught up in in Vader's arc and mm. the reveal and everything. So now that they're seeing more of him, they're very hyper focused on that mm. and I, Darth Vader I mean mm. <laughs> the the mask is iconic the dialogue is iconic mm. I mean those other ones are iconic too but I, I think that Darth Vader probably rises above the others uh, was Superman one of the choices Wendy Superman was one of the choices. Okay, I would have to say Superman yeah. and as much as I, I agree with what Perry says about Vader absolutely you have to look outside the fact that Superman crosses all medium right the score this the, is movie talk. It, well, I'm talking about it. When, uh, all the movies, people people stress about who's Older generation, cast. too. Yeah. I think that if I show like, my mom a picture of Vader and Superman, I mean, it's a little biased since my mom's only one person out of the whole world, right. but she would definitely recognize Superman more. She knows who Vader is, but she'd be right. like, she would be like, oh, Superman, yeah. yeah. He represents all this stuff. Right. Yeah, the comics, know, multiple titles. Especially in America. Yeah, in America. You know, right. They've done Smallville. There's no yeah. Darth Vader TV show. So like, the, to me, he's more iconic because he is supposed to re represent the best of us, mm -hmm. right? What we can be. We're supposed to aspire to be like Superman, even though he's Kryptonian. Yeah. But there's something about him. He's called the Big Blue Boy Scout and all that. And then even Man of Steel did a nice little twist on it. So, and when people were complaining about Batman versus Superman, the big biggest complaints were that Superman got marginalized in his own sequel. And yeah. so that's a that's a situation because people love this character. And I know some people hate it, think it's boring, whatever. I don't understand that kind of concept at all. And I think that's why he transcends. They do 75th anniversary TV specials on him. Multiple people have played him through the years and multiple TV shows. So to me, I think he's the little black and white films. Yeah, exactly. Yeah, 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 yeah. <clears throat> all right, how about two more? Okay. Uh, Caleb Elizondo writes, when movies say no animals were harmed, who confirms that, and is it always true that animals were fine? I can give a TV oh. example of that right away. One of my favorite shows on HBO, Luck, uh, oh, yeah. which was really good, Dustin Hoffman. Three horses died. They were filming season two. The third horse died. It was a horse racing show, and they had to cancel it, sadly, because the first season was very well done. It was a very interesting show. Uh, I think you had David Milch behind there, mm -hmm. and Michael Mann, I think, directed the pilot. It's excellent. And yeah, three horses did die, and they had to cancel the show because too many horses were dying. The races were so real. Mm -hmm. I mean, they were. And the horses died because well, of that. When they put that text on a movie. A lot of war I'm, movies, like Braveheart. Yeah. You see the horses yeah. going down and getting and stabbed like, with and spears. Like war and like Warhorse. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. War Horse, yeah. If they put that text on the movie, it better be true. And if for whatever reason it's not true, I'm just going to pretend it's true because it would break my heart to know that. But, I mean, in a, in a case like that show, mm -hmm. that, they, they that was the, they canceled that was they the canceled end of it. it. Yeah. 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 So, it's, so hopefully people and they really canceled are it adhering before. to It wasn't like the tabloids broke it. Look, three horses died. They should cancel the show. I mean, the studio took the responsibility, and they stopped it. Bef you know, they're like, hey, we need to stop this. Well, there's only one mm -hmm. organization that's the jurisdiction to do that on films. That's the American Humane Film and Television Unit. Mm -hmm. They specifically oversee this. And this has pro been progressing since the 40s, mm -hmm. right? They initially were all over it with all this stuff that was happening. It was an accident with a horse on a film called Jesse James. That sparked it, but then the Hayes Unit moved it over, and the Hayes Unit kind of killed it for 14 years, mm -hmm. and then they uh, bought it back through during the 60s and 70s, and definitely starting in the 80s, really, concentrated on having representatives from the American Humane Society there to monitor uh, how uh, uh, animals are treated on the film. And that's been their way through the whole, uh, the process through the whole thing with films up to now, including what happened with The Dog's Purpose, which was an unfortunate video that was mm -hmm. released. And who know, And both sides defended both sides. So like people were saying that it was taken out of context, and other people were saying, no, this is actually what happened on the, so it's a whole thing, you know? And so it's, it's it's definitely there, and thank God it's there because you're right. We we don't want to see people love animals to pieces. They don't want to see them hurt unnecessarily for greed or ego of creating these kinds of films. So you yeah. know what's interesting? Now I know it's different with animals mm -hmm. because one, they don't have a say. I know, I know Perry. I know you're an animal owner. You know Wendy's an animal. A lot of animal owners here. Mm -hmm. But didn't like somebody in the Expendables die? A stunt guy. Yeah, or, well, that yeah, happens. Yeah, yeah, that happens. But now I know it's different because yeah. they sign contracts. They're, they're also getting a paycheck for being right. a stuntman. They are aware of the consequences. But if you like touch an animal the wrong way, mm -hmm. that goes yeah. all over the tabloids. Somebody did die in one of the Expendables movies. No one really talked about it. It's, I mean, right. no, it's bad. I know humans yeah. versus animals. I know it's different because they sign contracts. People are aware of what's going on, aware of the risks. But mm -hmm. it is sad. Like animals get touched, movies, you know, get in trouble. Somebody dies, the Expendables. Yeah. No one really talk about. It. it doesn't really make headlines, which is too bad. It's yeah. too bad. It goes both ways. It's yeah. just sad. 
Too All right, bad. Wendy, can we turn it around with one more happy Twitter <laughs> Sorry question? about that. Sorry, I didn't mean to get dark there. I apologize. Well, I'm laughing dark. also because that fly has migrated its way over here, and then the chat, somebody in the chat room said the fly was harmed during the filming of this <laughs> movie. I was say, As I'm swatting at it. No yeah. more swatting get Brundle Fry. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> okay, this last, thing, last question comes from The Diz, who writes, out of these up and... Oh, my God. Get out of here. Oh out of these up and coming studios, mm -hmm. which one are you most excited about? A24, Focus Features, or Annapurna Pictures? Huh. Annapurna. I love what Annapurna's been doing. I mean, I, I was a huge fan of Focus, but Focus kind of receded to the background a little bit, and I feel like Annapurna is really taking that mantle and carrying it forward. So anytime I see Annapurna uh, in, in front of a trailer or at the end of a trailer, I go, okay, I'm going to mark that one down as something I might want to see. So definitely. A24 is building for me, but Annapurna is definitely established. If Focus has like faded to the background, it's just, I think they're so well established now. That's that what I mean. That's what they're, I mean. They're just, right. I, I expect them to mm -hmm. right. deliver interesting things. Annapurna, did they ever ever come to a conclusion with the whole uh, the uh, the bond stuff? Nobody's oh, nobody yeah. has yeah. the rights to it. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. If yeah. if they wind up being part of that franchise, I'm going to mm -hmm. have a very close eye on that company. Yep. But I uh, surprise surprise, I'm going to choose A24. I mean, that <laughs> yeah. is just such an exciting company that, you know, it started out in one end of the industry, it has grown to something completely different where I just really respect any filmmaker in this world that can teeter that line between delivering things that appeal to the masses, but also something that's insanely different. And they just show signs of a company that's willing to take risks. And yeah. I think we need groups like that. David, which one are you picking? Yeah, I'm excited for uh, A24, just mm -hmm. because, you know, Moonlight, uh, Green Room, yeah. all those great films you got. You know, uh, It Comes at Night, which Perry has been mm -hmm. repping, saying that's a great film. So I'm definitely A24. <sighs> that trailer for It Comes at Night, man. That's freaky. You look stressed. Yeah. God, you look stressed. Hella, that, that you still want to go see it, though, right? I do, absolutely. Okay. I'm in. When's that coming in. out? Okay. It's June, right? Um, June 9th. June 9th? Nice. Is that even a Friday? Maybe. They, that's the week seatbelts? after Wonder Woman. Yeah, uh, I, th I think yeah, that's... Yeah, some Wonder Woman on the I second or third, right. I think. Yeah, so do they have seatbelts on, the, on these... Like, I'll need a seatbelt on this They do. Uh, if, you go, if you go see the... Um, oh, what's it called? The, the Regal. Belt. They have yeah. the, the, the 4D <laughs> movies at the Regal Cinema I'm downtown. I'm be and the, the like seats move and everything. Yeah, they have oh, seatbelts. Yeah. They have seatbelts. <laughs> All right, well, that leaves you with a great image. So that's it for oh. Friday Movie Talk. <laughs> Thank you guys so much for watching. Before we close out the show, I want to thank all the guys behind the scenes. We have Adam, Cody, and Brundlefly back there. You guys are all awesome. And now, let's go around the table. Roka, where can the folks find you? Oh, you guys can always find me at the Roka Says on Twitter and on Instagram every Friday here on Collider Movie Talk. And also, the Cinephiles drops every Friday. We just did Black Stallion. The Black Stallion, if anybody remembers from 1981, a fantastic film with Mickey Rooney. Uh, we just dropped that this morning. It's on iTunes and on Stitcher and on YouTube as well. And of course, the Outlaw Nation podcast, episode mm -hmm. three, dropped yesterday, talking about The Rock interview, talking about Marvel versus DC, talking about Chris Cornell's unfortunate passing, talking about a number of subjects. You guys know what Outlaw Nation's all about, and it's been a great time. And David has agreed to come on next week to talk to Alien Franchise mm -hmm. after he goes to see Covenant. I'm going to go see on Sunday, nice. so we're going to talk after that. And definitely, so he's going to be my guest next week. It's, a, it's, a, it's been a fun thing, and you guys have been fantastic to respond to it. And of course, watch the interview that I had with The Rock that is on the Schmoes No channel, I think, and the Collider channel there. You can see my jiggly parts running on the beach. There we go. Oh, my God. Oh, no. <laughs> yeah, you look that. so disturbed. Um, so, on that note, uh, I like, as I alluded to earlier, you know, TV talk is going to be massive on Monday. There's so much to talk about. Like, we have the Black Lightning trailer, uh, one of my favorite video game franchises of all time, The Witcher, is being developed by uh, Netflix. That's also big news. All the, basically, all the studios had their upfront presentations, so there's tons of trailers to talk about, and I can't wait. So, Monday's going to be a great show on TV talk. And I'm also at Griffin DE on Twitter and Instagram. There sorry. we go. <laughs> sorry about that. Thanks for the cut, Adam. Wendy, where can everyone wow. find you? <laughs> you can find me on YouTube at the Movie Couple channel. It's my turn to speak, guys. It's my turn to speak. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Nice the Wendy. Movie Couple channel on YouTube at Wendy Lee Zaney on Twitter, Instagram, and Snapchat. And you can catch me on Twitter and Instagram at P. Nemiroff. Tomorrow, 2 p.m. PST, we have a brand new episode of Collider Behind the Scenes. Again, thank you guys so much for watching. It's been a great week. Have a great weekend, and we'll see you on Monday. Hey, guys, if you like this video, click the thumbs up button. Also, make sure you subscribe to our YouTube channel. It'll help you stay up to date with everything we've got going on here at Collider.